Hi everyone, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm uh, Head of Business Development and Scouting at Critical Reflex. We're an indie publisher. You might know us from our games or from those toad bags you got as you entered. And uh, today's talk is called Indie Publishing 101 or Indie Publishing Crash Course. Uh, it's going to be an entry-level talk where I'll uh, talk about you know, how indie publishing works and what to expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hopefully I'll speed run it in like 15 minutes and uh, we'll have more time for questions because those are usually the most interesting part. Um, yeah, let's start. So, quickly about Critical Reflex and myself. We're an indie publisher established in 2020. You might know us from Godot games such as Buckshot Roulette or Arctic Eggs and also some other games like uh, Lunacid and most recently Mouthwashing. Uh, and our whole thing is that we look for games that are very different and unique in terms of what they're doing gameplays and storytelling wise. Maybe something a little bit more edgy, maybe something that's too risky for a lot of other publishers. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's how we roll. Uh, and about myself personally, I've been in uh, publishing for eight years, started in customer support, did some community management, was a publishing producer here at Critical Reflex for like a year and a half, realized that I'm actually pretty shit at being a producer and much better at you know, scouting games, talking to people and stuff like that. So that's how I uh, became BD and Scout. As you can probably tell, uh, looking at this presentation, I'm not a graphics designer. Uh, but also treat this as a stylistic choice. Uh, and in terms of the game designer, personally, I'm a big fan of CRPG, so if you're making one, uh, come and talk to me. All right, so in general, why do you need a publisher? What is the indie publishing model? Uh, those of you who have shipped games probably know that other than developing the game itself, it involves a shit ton of other things like you know, localizing your game, porting your game, doing all the marketing things to ensure people actually know about your game. And those things are not rocket science. You can definitely do them all yourself, but it involves a lot of time and money and just you know, uh, time, like people. <laughs> um, so you can do it yourself, especially if you get funding uh, through like government soft money and uh, VC for equity funding or um, other funds. Uh, but publishing model is probably still the most uh, popular one because on top of that funding, you, uh, you get help with all of those things. You don't need to worry about them. The only thing you need to worry about is actually developing the game. Um, and yeah, the model works uh, this way. So usually if you do need funding, uh, you come up with milestones for your development, you get paid for each of those milestones, uh, and then once the game is released, the publisher recoups their investment, and you start splitting the profit, uh, usually somewhere along the lines of like 70-30 in favor of the developer to 50-50. If someone offers you anything less than 50-50, you can tell them to fuck off, basically, in most cases. All right, so usually uh, how the signing flow works is that publishers find you, or you find the publishers, uh, different events online and offline, or you just hit them up, you go to the website, find the pitching form, or the best case scenario, if, that, if a publisher finds you, that just means they really want your game and you're already in a good position. Uh, during the first pitch meeting, um, you're expected to have a pitch deck that you know, outlines what is your game, why is it good, uh, you know, why you will be able to make it, you know, your experience as a team, uh, your timeline, uh, your budget, things like that. Um, and 99% of the time you need some sort of a playable build to present to a publisher as well. Uh, and after a pitch meeting, your game will go through uh, the evaluation uh, process, which is uh, different for every publisher. Sometimes it takes like a week or two. In most cases these days it takes months, and I know of cases where it takes years. Uh, and then you'll probably have a follow-up meeting or two where the publisher will have some questions about the game itself or the development process. And if everything works out um, and the stars align, you will get an offer, which is usually like a term sheet, one or two pages outlining everything the publisher will do for you and what they want in return. Uh, and that is a stage where you are expected to uh, negotiate that offer. If there's something in there you don't like or something is missing, definitely talk to your publisher about it. And once you're good with the offer and everything makes sense, then it's contract negotiation time. Um, 
please never sign a contract like the first draft that is sent to you by the publisher because even if it's a good contract, it always serves the publisher more than it does you. Uh, so this is also some, uh, somewhere where you expect it to negotiate. So what does a publisher actually do for you once you sign with them? Uh, you know, it, unless this is specifically your arrangement, a good publisher doesn't go in fire and forget mode. So you will have uh, frequent communication with your publisher, maybe like once a week or once every two weeks. They'll uh, help you with uh, game design uh, feedback and advice. They'll help you set up your processes if you're a newer team and you need help with project management. A uh, publisher should be taking care of all the stuff marketing, so producing marketing assets, like you know everything that goes on the Steam page, all the capsules, all the social media art, all the trailers. Uh, stuff like that, a publisher should be handling uh, your PR and influencers, community management, uh, doing events and showcases both online and offline, and a good publisher will do things for your game uh, outside of the standard scope in terms of marketing, like coming up with some uh, tailor-made creative marketing uh, activations. Uh, and other services include localization, porting, QA, uh, dealing with like Steam, Xbox, Sony, uh, and uh, Nintendo. Uh, yeah, so in general, all this stuff is very doable if you go in for self-publishing, especially if you have uh, the funding. But it's just, it can be a lot of pain, so it's good that if you have a reliable partner that can deal with that stuff for you. So what makes a publisher a good fit? Uh, there is a dating metaphor that is used often, and I think it works really well. So your pitch meeting with a publisher is basically your first date, and if you don't like them, there is no reason for you to get married to them, right? Like personal relationship is very important, so if you just don't vibe with them, unless it's your only resort, probably look for someone else, because if you don't vibe with them in the first meeting, and you'll have to work with them for like two, three years, there is uh, no reason to believe it's gonna get better. Um, They've published uh, projects that are similar to yours. That is just a good indicator that they have the ear of the audience which likes games that are similar to yours, so that's always good, and an indicator that they know how to work with those games. Uh, you like what they've done for others, that means that don't judge a publisher just by how successful the games were, because there are some publishers who are really good at signing games that would have done well even without them, but just like, Check out some of the games that are out, see what they've done like in terms of influencers, in terms of community building, in terms of their event presence. And if you see that the publisher is you know, doing the work even for games that are not explosive uh, success stories, that's always uh, a good sign. And probably most importantly, uh, talk to other developers who have worked or are currently working with that publisher um, there is no clause in the contract usually, uh, at least to my knowledge, that says that a developer cannot uh, privately talk shit about their publisher. So uh, it's, it's a good uh, way to suss out if a publisher is you know, pleasant to work with or not. So uh, how to not get uh, screwed over. Uh, first of all, you need to know what you need as a studio to stay afloat if your game is not an immediate hit. Uh, most publishing agreements, at least like first drafts, would include 100% recoup for a publisher, which means before you see one cent from sales of your game, uh, the publisher will make all the money they spent on that game. Uh, that is usually something a publisher is willing to negotiate on, right? So if you know uh, that as a studio, in order to survive, you need some income, like a month, two months after your game came out, make sure you have not 100% recoup rate in the contract, or make sure you get a minimum guarantee when the game is released. And a minimum guarantee is just basically like advanced uh, on royalties. Uh, know the standard industry deals and contracts, that stuff is available online. You probably heard, if you like, looked into it, that there's a Raw Fury contract that they famously published in 2020. That used to be a good contract. It's still a very decent one. I, I think they updated it since then. Uh, I would think so, at least. Um, and there are some other contracts available uh, on some publishers' websites, so check them out uh, and then compare them against what you're getting to you know, make sure you're getting a fair deal. 
Uh, get a video game lawyer uh, once you get a contract. A video game is very important because I've talked to a lot of uh, developers who would uh, seek help from just a regular entertainment lawyer and sometimes they don't really know specifics of video game publishing so that can be uh, a bit complicated so yeah always good to have a lawyer look at your contract and yeah I mean if you can't afford one I mean it's always a good idea to ask publisher to like, provide you one we'll do it for for those developers who uh, don't have the funds to do it themselves but yeah, just look at the contract yourself as well and compare them to what's out there. And yeah, talk to other devs, send to the publisher, or I already mentioned that. Uh, yeah, and now uh, why am I standing on this stage specifically? Uh, as a publisher, we really like Godot games. We have the most success that we have with, was with a Godot game, um, Buckshot Roulette. Uh, our whole thing is doing like weird games, maybe games from developers who do very experimental stuff who want to do something a little bit more commercial while staying true to, to themselves and not feeling like they're selling out. And a lot of games like that are made with Godot. So uh, yeah, uh, that's why we love Godot games specifically. Um, I mean, I already talked about how cool we are and uh, I don't really have anything prepared for this last segment, so. How much time do we have left? We got like 15 minutes, that's good. I speed ran the shit out of it. All right, questions. What are the most common mistakes people make when pitching their game? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'd say pitching too early is pretty common, and it depends on the game. And most publishers will tell you that it's never early as long as you have a build. But I can tell you that if your game relies heavily on like the visual presentation, on the art style, on the overall vibe, it is a good idea to have something closer to a vertical slice, which represents the final quality of the game when you pitch. Uh, it's totally normal to pitch very early and then the publisher tells you, please come back when you have something more uh, like resembling vertical slice and they will talk to you again if the first time was too early, but you, know, you can only make first impression once. So that's one. Uh, and then the other one would probably be Appear, appearing like you don't know what you're talking about in a pitch deck, um, right? Like your budget doesn't make sense, you want like insane salary, um, or the timeline doesn't make sense, you have a very ambitious game that you're making with three people and you want to make it in like six months. So yeah, just uh, with a little bit of research and looking at the pitch decks, uh, that's easy to avoid. Thanks for the amazing talk. I was wondering how strongly your conditions or contracts vary from game to game and what kind of parameters those usually are. Uh, sorry, what was the um, last thing you said? Uh, which parameters of this contract usually changes? Of course, the sum, but if there's something else that would be interesting. Yeah, so we normally have like a contract template. So it starts out about the same. Uh, I think the biggest difference uh, is whether your game needs funding or not, because if you don't need development funding, that means there is no point in having milestones uh, in the contract and you can just develop the game uh, at your own pace. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's a, usually a pretty standard contract. And then if a developer tells us, oh, actually, we want you to have like a non-exclusive uh, merch license as opposed to an exclusive one because we want to do merch ourselves as well. And we're going to say, yeah, sure, that's fine. We're just going to take um, like 5% more of the merch that we sell in that case or something like that. Or the developer will say, well, this contract duration is uh, five years, but we want to make it three years. And we're like, yeah, no, that's fine. So um, it starts out as a pretty standard contract and then it, whatever you know, the developer wants and whatever makes sense um, in their case. Yeah. 
Thank you for the talk. And uh, here, uh, you mentioned the the game should be commercial. I was thinking, uh, how does that translate? Like in the terms of the duration of the game, you have some games that are less than two hours. They are discarded or, yeah. Yeah, um, so actually most of our successful games to date are pretty short. So box shot roulette, um, I mean, it's kind of like a endless game um, in a sense, but usually people play it for a couple of hours. Uh, Arctic Eggs is like a couple of hours, mouthwashing is the same, so it's fine. Uh, it, it's a, somewhat helpful to have your game to be over two hours because that's the refund window <laughs> on Steam. Um, but yeah, two, three hours experiences, uh, if they're like condensed and there's no filler, people like those games, so that's not an issue. Um, so, what's roughly the check size that you guys you know, tend uh, to offer? Uh, sure. So, we go up to one million, uh, but in actuality, uh, to date, our most expensive games are around 700, 750, and most of our games are around like two, three hundred thousand. Could you um, talk a little bit about like a normal negotiation process or what could be asked during negotiation or something like that? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously it depends on what you're presented with. Uh, some of the things that you should probably look for in a contract and something that might be a negotiating point is whether a publisher recoups uh, first party costs. Um, so third party costs are expenses that we take on as a publisher where we actually pay others money to do stuff for the game. Like, you know, we go to an event and we pay actual money to have a booth there. First party costs is kind of a made up thing where a publisher says, oh, you know, our marketing department worked on this marketing plan for 100 hours and we're gonna bill you for it. That's, in my opinion, bullshit and shouldn't exist. So, you know, something like that shouldn't be in the contract. Um, look at the termination clauses, like what can trigger termination? Can publisher just terminate the contract because they feel like it? What happens if they do? You know, who keeps the game? Do you still get royalties if they finish the game? Stuff like that. Um, so that's in terms of the contract negotiation. In terms of offer negotiation, I mean, it probably just like, you know, you don't like the percentage uh, split um, or I don't know, you, you want a recoup uh, rate to be different or you want to add that, you know, publisher take care, takes care of I don't know, let's say localization, they put two languages and you want five or something like that. Hi, first of all, I love the dunks. Um, <laughs> have you ever thought about actually developing a game in-house? And if not, why? We are developing a game in-house. It hasn't been announced yet, but um, yeah, we, we have a, an internal studio that is comprised of one person. Um, she uh, pitched, uh, well, so I went to this um, small stream where developers were pitch, um, showcasing their pitches and I was helping them uh, refine their pitches. And there was a pitch for this uh, porn game. Uh, but the art style was absolutely beautiful. I just told her, like, you want to do a game with us? That's not going to be a porn game, but, you know, with the same memories in the art style. And she was like, hell yeah. Um, so, yeah, we do. Um, is it a faux pas to sign up uh, with a publisher for one game, and then if we make another game, sign up with another publisher? Like, would it get them upset? No, that's totally normal. Happens all the time. Um, most publishers, including ourselves, will tell you during like a pitch meeting that 
our goal is to build good relationships with our developers where after publishing their first game, they're successful enough to self-publish their second one, but they would still choose to work with us because we're nice to work with. Um, and that happens to like, some developers. Like, you, can, you can look at Free Lives who publish like five or six game with Devolver uh, at this point, uh, but it's also absolutely normal for a developer to go shop for another publisher uh, once they're uh, done with their, with their first game with a different publisher. Um, usually there's something called uh, right of the first refusal clause in the contract, which, which says that you will have to pitch to your current publisher before you pitch to anyone else. And if they make you an offer and you don't like it, you can just tell them no, and then you're free to go pitch to everyone else. Uh, that clause is also very uh, easy to get rid of. Like usually, publishers will will not insist on having it in there. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I've heard from contacts in the industry that for them it is actually easier to pitch larger projects, right? So in publishing, it's easier to get a publisher for a larger project, um, which is a bit upside down, I feel. I don't know, wanted to hear your perspective about it, and um, I don't know how, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I think that was the case a couple of hours ago. You might have heard something about the current funding situation in the indie space. Uh, basically, a lot of publishers became uh, much more conservative with their funding uh, in the recent years, so there was the surge of funding during COVID 2021, 20, 22, and then it kind of dried, uh, dried out a little bit. I think uh, there is this space in the middle which got kind of fucked, so it's easy to find funding for your game if it's like sub half a million, uh, maybe like two, three hundred thousand, so that's the space we operate in. And then it's still fairly, well, I wouldn't say easy, but you can find funding for your project if it's like three, five million. There are publishers that specialize on that ticket size. If your game is like one, two million uh, and you're in the middle, that is a little bit tougher these days, uh, although there are still publishers who, who deal with uh, check size of a couple mil. But yeah, no, I, I feel like, especially recently, uh, a lot of publishers are you know, looking specifically towards cheaper games, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I'd like to ask um, some, if you have any like um, surface level tips on how to suss out uh, pub um, publishers that are you know, doing something weird or perhaps, uh, you know, strongly not in favor of the developer, like in terms of the offer or contract. And like as a sub point, uh, how does that specific relate to uh, retaining copyright over the game? Yeah, uh, IP is not something I mentioned during this talk. Uh, it is quite uncommon these days for a publisher to ask for the IP. If a publisher is asking for your IP without giving you anything else in return, that's kind of weird. Um, you know, if they do ask them to throw it out, if they're going to be reluctant to do so, then yeah, it's not a good sign. Uh, but in general, uh, to suss out if a publisher is doing something not dev friendly, like I already mentioned in the talk, I think the, the best way is just to talk to other developers who already work with that publisher. Uh, 